Monday, the third day of December, 1923, a century ago. Glen, a small and peaceful village in East Kerry, five miles to the southeast of Castle Island. The Civil War ended just seven months ago, and the general election in August passed off largely peacefully in Kerry. A civilian population, weary of years of war, killing, murder and political turmoil, yearns for peace, stability and progress. There is a desire to get on with life and to enjoy brighter days. But deep-seated political tensions and underlying bitternesses remain. Peace is fragile. Communities remain on edge and personal and political antagonisms remain an undercurrent in society. The civil war has left a community and families divided. Though the fighting may have ended, arms and ammunition remain in the hands of many. A new police force on Garda Siakana, Guardians of the Peace, has been established to replace the Civic Guard and they are establishing their presence in every part of the country. Among the newly recruited Gardaí was 22-year-old James Woods, who took up a position as sergeant at Scartiglen Garda Station in May 1923, just as the Civil War came to an end. Six months later, he would be brutally murdered in the Garda Station in an incident which shocked the county and the country. In the aftermath of his killing, a local man would be shot and seriously wounded, a young blacksmith would be executed on the roadside near his home, and a lieutenant in the Free State Army would be hanged after being sentenced to death. It was one of the darkest episodes in the history of East Kerry and the county as a whole, and it all happened a century ago. So how and why did Sergeant James Woods become the first ever guard the sergeant in Ireland to be murdered in the line of duty? Who were his assailants? And why was there such a violent reaction to his death in the depths of the winter of 1923? And how and why did a dramatic series of reprisals occur at a time of such political tension in East Kerry and in the country as a whole? Like every story, this one starts at the beginning. James Woods was born at Ballyreen near Listoon Varna in North County Clare on the 25th of March 1900. He was one of a family of six children, born to farmer James Woods and his wife Margaret. James Woods attended the local primary school and went on to the De La Salle Preparatory Teaching College in Mallow, and then on to the De La Salle Teacher Training College at Waterford with the support of a prestigious King's Scholarship. During the War of Independence, he was a member of the local IRA, along with his brother Thomas and Michael and they took the fight to the Crown Forces in West County Clare. On the 15th of November 1922, while the Civil War was underway, James Woods joined the Civic Guard, which a year later would be reconstituted and renamed on Garda Siakana. Just a few weeks before he joined the force, James had sent a letter to the Garda Commissioner, General Owen O'Duffy. The letter, which is still in existence, reads as follows. Sir, I beg to offer myself as a candidate for the Irish Civic Guards. I am six feet and a half inch in height and 37 and a half inches around the chest and 22 years of age. I am declared medically fit by the doctor and I can produce all references when required. I have received a good education having passed the King's Scholarship in 1921 and spent a year in De La Salle Training College, Waterford. I have also a fair knowledge of Irish. If you shall take me into your service, I shall do all in my power to do my duty faithfully and render you satisfaction in every way. I am your obedient servant, James Woods. Two of Woods's brothers, Thomas and Michael, also joined the Civic Guard, Tom becoming a superintendent and Michael a sergeant. As such, even though they had no active role in the Civil War, the brothers, including James, could be said to have been pro-treaty, or at least not opponents of the new Free State or its agencies. James Wood's first posting was to Bantry in November 1922. He was promoted to the rank of sergeant on the 1st of May 1923 and was transferred to Scarthy Glen Garda Station later that month. Garda stations at the time were often rudimentary and were sometimes part of existing buildings or dwellings, and in some cases, private houses. 
This was often a necessity in rural villages where barracks or purpose-built headquarters did not exist at the time. Scartaglen Garda Station was part of the house where Jeremiah Lyons and his family lived in the centre of the village. The Garda Station and day room was on the ground floor and, as was common at the time, the Garda had their living quarters upstairs. It appears that the family and the Garda shared a common kitchen. According to a report from the time, Quote, Lyons and his family reside in the remaining portion of the house. The door leading to the house was common to the Gardaí and the other occupants of the house. Among those based at Scarta Glen with Sergeant James Woods was Garda Patrick J. Spillane, a native of Blarney, County Cork, and who joined on Garda Siakana on the 10th of January 1923. Garda Spillane was transferred to Scarta Glen in May 1923 at around the same time that James Woods took up his posting there as sergeant. Spillane was at the barrack orderly. By November 1923, there were four Garda based at the station, Sergeant Woods and Garda Spillane, along with a Garda Boylan and a Garda Geraghty. A report prepared for the Minister for Home Affairs describes the atmosphere in Scarta Glen at this time and how the Gardaí and the community interacted with each other, and I quote, From the establishment of this station at Scarta Glen down to the present month, December 1923, nothing untoward happened. The Gardaí were doing their duty satisfactorily, and the people were of the most friendly character. Sergeant Woods was described in accounts from the time as very popular in the locality, and a report claimed that he was not, quote, overzealous in his duties. It must be remembered, of course, that as the new and unarmed police force in the new free state, its members were charged with restoring calm and order in the politically febrile period after the Civil War. Moreover, Woods was being posted at just 22 years of age to a strongly anti-treaty county and a part of Kerry in which republicanism ran deep. As such, Woods and his colleagues had to strike the right balance between enforcing the law and also winning the trust of the communities in which they were now based. And so to the events of Monday the 3rd of December 1923. At about 8pm that evening, Sergeant Woods was in the day room of the station and Garda Spillane was in the kitchen. Their colleagues Garda Geraghty and Garda Boylan were out on patrol. Also in the kitchen, playing a game of cards with Garda Spillane, were three local men, including Jeremiah Tangney and Michael and James Carney, as well as the man of the house, Jeremiah Lyons. Suddenly, six armed men, who were wearing handkerchiefs over their faces and whose faces were blackened in disguise, entered the station by the front door. Each of them was armed with a gun. They entered the kitchen shouting, Hands up! One of the men in the kitchen, James Carney, was hit on the forehead by one of the raiders with the butt of his rifle and had his nose broken. Garda Spillane, meanwhile, who was sitting by the fire, was ordered upstairs at gunpoint by two of the masked men. The following is from a report prepared for the Minister for Home Affairs, Kevin O'Higgins, which summarises what followed, and I quote, When the two armed and disguised men got Garda Spillane upstairs, they proceeded to strip him, which they did, and broke open three boxes belonging to the Garda and took therefrom all the money contained in the boxes, as well as some articles of wearing apparel. When Garda Spillane had been stripped and the boxes robbed, one of the armed and disguised men came downstairs and asked the occupants of the house where the sergeant was. Sergeant James Woods, who had been in the day room, entered the hallway at the bottom of the stairs and was ordered to put his hands up at gunpoint. Woods put his hands up, and like Garda Spillane, was ordered upstairs. As he was climbing the stairs, Woods was struck on the back with the muzzle of a rifle. The muzzle of the rifle also struck the ceiling overhead before a shot was discharged, the bullet entering Woods' head at the base of the skull and exiting at the top of his head. Woods died instantly. The Liberator newspaper described how, quote, his skull was split in twain, adding that death was instantaneous. Witnesses claimed that the man who shot Woods believed that the Garda was, quote, shamming, 
or pretending to be hit, and he kicked him and struck him with his rifle again. But when he noticed blood, he ordered the others to, quote, come away. The raiders gathered the money, uniforms, clothing and other items they had stolen and made their escape. The local doctor was summoned to the barracks and the parish priest administered the last rites. The woman of the house, Bridget Lyons, Jeremiah's wife, laid the dead man on the kitchen table and, according to sources, attempted to put parts of his brain back into his skull before she bandaged up his head. Sergeant Woods's remains were removed to the county infirmary in Tralee. In the hours after the shooting, Garda Spillan reported what had happened to the Free State Army post at nearby Castle Island, which in turn sent a report to the Kerry Command headquarters at the Brian Houlihan barracks in Tralee. The inquest into the death of Sergeant Woods was held the day after he was killed. Dr William Prendeville of Castle Island gave evidence of the injuries, describing how Woods' head was, quote, horribly mangled, and how he could fit three of his fingers into the wound in the sergeant's head. Woods' funeral took place at St John's Church in Tralee. His coffin was shouldered from the church by the Chief Superintendent of Angarda Siakana in Kerry, J.J. Hannigan, and his senior officers. From Tralee, the coffin was transported back to Listoon Varna in County Clare on the roof of a car, in the absence of any hearse. It was draped in the tricolour. The funeral's journey back to Clare was not straightforward. As the cortege travelled out of Tralee, the road was obstructed by a horse cart and the cortege was stopped on the road by a gang of men. Sergeant Woods's brother, Thomas, challenged the men who claimed that they did not recognise the tricolour draped over the Garda's coffin. Thomas, also a Garda, brandished a gun, but his mother appealed for calm. Enough blood has been spilt, she declared. Following a standoff, the cortege was allowed on its way. Requiem Mass was celebrated at Listoon Varna, before the burial at Kalela Cemetery, about four miles away. The newly formed Garda Siakana Band travelled from Dublin to lead the cortege. The funeral and burial were attended by the newly appointed Commissioner of Garda Siakana, Owen O'Duffy. O'Duffy was a powerful orator, something which he would later use to great effect when he led the Blue Shirts in the 1930s. O'Duffy used James Woods's funeral to condemn his killers and to emphasise the determination of the new police force. And I quote from his oration. I know that this murder will be condemned in every home in Kerry, as well as I have seen it condemned in every other part of the country. I know the volunteers of Kerry, and no matter how they may think politically, I am sure none of them would be guilty of such an outrage. I am glad to know that his death is universally mourned in the district. On behalf of the President and the Minister for Home Affairs, I tender to his parents our most heartfelt sympathy in their bereavement. May the sod rest lightly over his mortal remains, and may God forgive those who sent him before the judgment seat without time to make an act of contrition. In conclusion, I send this message from his grave. Be not daunted. Carry on your work. You are doing useful and valuable work for Ireland. Yield only in death. In the days after the funeral, O'Duffy visited Scarta Glen, as well as Garda headquarters in Tralee, and he reported on the matter to the Minister for Home Affairs in Dublin. Sergeant Woods, of course, was not the very first member of the new police force to be killed on duty. Just over a year previously, on the 14th of November 1922, at Mullinahone in County Tipperary, Henry Phelan of the Civic Guard was shot dead by two armed men when he went into a shop in the village. But Woods was the first Garda, using that name for the force, to be killed in the line of duty. And he was the very first sergeant of the force to be killed in service. There was local and national shock and horror at what had occurred in Scarta Glen. There was also widespread condemnation in the press of the killing of the sergeant. 
In an editorial published in the Cork Examiner, for example, the killing was described as an appalling tragedy. The editorial went on. Persons who put on masks and with rifles in their hands burst in to the house, house of unarmed men whose mission is to help the people are entitled to no sympathy even from the emotional persons who think anyone in the clutches of the law as objects for pity. Crime of every sort must be vigorously suppressed if this country is to retain any reputation for civilization. So, was the killing of James Woods a premeditated murder? Or was it an unintended killing that took place during the planned robbery of a Garda station? And most importantly, who killed him? From the outset, the authorities believed that robbery was the motive of the assailants and that the killing of Sergeant Woods was not intentional, nor that it was necessarily politically motivated. It was noted, for example, that the masked men did not interfere with or steal the guard the notebooks or files in the station, but focused instead on the clothing and valuables upstairs, which they threw downstairs to their fellow thieves. A report to Minister O'Higgins stated, We believe that the object of this raid was robbery, and the murder of Sergeant Woods was not intended. Another guard, the report, describes the killing as a case of misadventure. There was a belief from the outset, though, that the men involved in the robbery of the Garda station were local Republicans, who had been active in the IRA on the anti-treaty side during the Civil War. It was accepted in correspondence on Garda files that the men might not have been active as Republicans at the time they attacked the Garda station in December 1923, but that they had a history of anti-treaty activity during this recent civil war. One report, which is held in the National Archives, stated, The murder of Sergeant Woods was the work of a dangerous gang who are armed and have been operating in the locality for a considerable time. They had been irregulars, but since the activities of the irregulars ceased, were working on their own, carrying out raids, etc. There is other evidence to suggest that those involved in the attack on the Garda station were Republicans and may have had political motivations. As I mentioned earlier, one of the civilians in the kitchen on the evening in question was James Carney. He was badly injured when he was struck on the head by one of the raiders. A Garda report claimed that Carney was a Free State supporter and had acted as a personation agent for Common and Isle during the recent general election in August 1923. Gordy concluded that this meant that not only was Kearney known to the raiders, who must therefore have been local, but that Kearney was attacked because of his Free State supporting politics, presumably by Republicans. In a dramatic development immediately after the killing of Sergeant Woods, the IRA leadership in Kerry moved to distance themselves from what had occurred and to deny any involvement of any IRA members. A letter signed by the commanding officers of the Kerry No. 1 and No. 2 Brigades, Humphrey Murphy and John Joe Rice, was published in the local and national newspapers two days after the death of the Garda. In it, they took issue with comments in the press about the use of hidden guns being used in Ireland as a threat to public peace, which they argued implied that IRA weapons had been used in Scarta Glen. The letter from Murphy and Rice went on. We emphatically repudiate the insinuation, and we can confidently assure the public that the arms used in this raid and murder do not belong to the Irish Republican Army, and also that no Republican soldier was implicated in the crime. We earnestly hope that the raiders will be brought to justice quickly. We believe that the truth about the raid on the Civic Guard station, which had such terrible results, would, if published, create no little sensation. To the relatives of the late Sergeant Woods, we offer our sympathy. This letter, I think, is very significant. If the men who were involved in the death of Sergeant Woods were Republicans, and it would subsequently turn out that many of them were, why would the IRA leadership in Kerry have moved to maintain a distance? It is more likely, perhaps, that Murphy and Rice knew some of the men involved and, in the interests of good politics, were anxious to deny any knowledge of or any official sanction for the attack. 
a Garda sergeant had been murdered after all, and the IRA did not want to or need to be in the spotlight or the firing line when it came to apportioning blame. Whoever was involved in the incident and whatever their motives, the army leadership as well as Gardaí and Kerry came under significant pressure to solve the crime and to bring the perpetrators to justice. The army had a role in such investigations at this time because it was considered a political crime. The investigation was led by Captain Walsh of the Free State Army Garrison in Tralee and the Garda inquiry by Superintendent J.J. Hannigan, also based in Tralee. But one senior figure in the Free State Army decided to take it upon himself to investigate what had occurred at Scartaglen Garda Station and to use the opportunity to exert his influence locally and terrorise the local population. This had extremely devastating consequences for many of the people of East Kerry, but also for himself. Enter Lieutenant Jeremiah Gaffney, a particularly vicious, temperamental and volatile Free State Army officer who would forever be associated with the events in East Kerry in 1923, as well as many of the most appalling episodes of the Civil War in Kerry. Briefly by way of background, Gaffney was born Gerald Gaffney at Amian Street in Dublin in 1900. He joined Fina Aaron in 1915 and he was active, an active member of the Dublin Brigade of the IRA during the War of Independence. In a character reference later submitted by ex-comrades, the most high profile of whom were two confidants of Michael Collins and David Nelligan, it was stated that Quote, as a member of the IRA Active Service Unit, Gaffney did some very useful work in the old days and also took a very active part in the recent fighting, both in Dublin and Kerry. All his actions having been performed in a spirit which was a great incentive to his men, who always looked to him as one who inspired courage, forbearance and a true spirit of patriotism. Following the signing of the treaty, Jeremiah Gaffney went pro-treaty and in the words of his mother, marched into Dublin in his green uniform to join the army. Gaffney travelled on the Lady Wicklow with the Dublin Guard, which landed 450 troops at Fianna in August 1922. Despite only being in his early 20s, he was appointed to the role of lieutenant in the Kerry Command and by the end of the Civil War was posted to Castle Island Barracks. The barracks in Castle Island had a reputation for the particularly brutal treatment of IRA prisoners. It was from there, for example, that Paddy Pats O'Connor and other soldiers were lured to their deaths at Knocknagoshal on the 6th of March 1923. Gaffney was directly involved in the events of this period towards the end of the Civil War. A few weeks after the killing of five Free State soldiers at Knocknagoshal, Gaffney oversaw the arrest and murder of Dan Murphy at whose forge the trip mine which killed the five soldiers was allegedly constructed. On Gaffney's orders, Murphy had been shot dead in a field not far from the site of the explosion on the 24th of March 1923. His shooting was witnessed by a local schoolgirl. Gaffney also had first-hand experience of IRA violence during the war in Kerry. He was present when the very last Free State soldier to die in the county during the Civil War was killed near Corrow on the 23rd of April 1923. A Lieutenant Michael Behan was shot dead in an IRA ambush from which Gaffney escaped. It might be said therefore that Jeremiah Gaffney was one of those who experienced the violence of the Civil War at first hand and was one of those for whom violence and bloodshed had become largely somewhat normal. After the Civil War, Gaffney remained at his post at Castle Island, an area with which he became very familiar during 1922 and 23. According to one of his superiors, Gaffney was selected for the posting to East Kerry because, quote, he was the best man for the job because of his past experience. He was free to act at his own discretion as he had been in charge of parties of soldiers before and he knew the district, end quote. And yet, Gaffney at this time was just about 22 years old, and it is quite remarkable that someone so young wielded so much power and influence in the army in Kerry. Gaffney was known as a hard drinker, 
who oversaw a group of undisciplined and careless soldiers who were known to throw their weight around in the greater Castle Island area even after the Civil War ended. Suffice to say that Gaffney, despite his young age, was ruthless, volatile and violent, with little or no time for the norms of soldiery or the rule of law. Gaffney would have considered the killing of Sergeant James Woods as an attack on the free state. He took it upon himself to carry out a series of reprisals following the murder at Scartaglin Garda Station. To return to the immediate aftermath of the death of Sergeant Woods, early on the morning of the 4th of December, just hours after Woods was killed, the centre of activity moved to nearby Dromulton, a townland between Scartaglen and Corro. A party of Free State Army soldiers under the command of Lieutenant Gaffney raided the home of David O'Connor, which was about a mile from Scartaglen. O'Connor had been active in the IRA locally during the War of Independence and took the anti-treaty side during the Civil War, taking part in a number of engagements against the Free State Army. O'Connor and his sons had been jailed several times in the later months of the Civil War. The O'Connors were well-known Republicans in the locality and they were known to occasionally shelter men on the run. A number of men were staying at the house on the night this incident occurred, including Pat Healy and Pat Kerrisk, as well as David's sons Patrick and Willie O'Connor. Also staying there that night was Con Horan, a young servant and labourer who worked for the O'Connors. At about six o'clock in the morning, on the 4th of December, Gaffney and three other Free State Army soldiers knocked loudly on the door of the O'Connor home. Mrs Kate O'Connor answered the door and the soldiers forced their way in, waving a flashlight in her face and asking, where are the boys? The men who were sleeping upstairs were dragged out into the yard in their nightshirts. They were abused and manhandled by the soldiers and several shots were fired into the air. The man of the house, David O'Connor, was shot at in the darkness, but he was not injured and he made his escape across the fields. In his military pension application submitted many years later, David O'Connor claimed that Gaffney had come to his home with the intention of murdering me. The other men managed to escape too, to a nearby house. As I mentioned, among those staying at the O'Connor home that night was a servant and labourer who worked with the O'Connors called Con Horan. He had no involvement in the incident at Scartaglen Garda Station, nor had he any known involvement in politics or Republican activity. During the raid at O'Connor's, Horan was shot in the back by one of the soldiers, most likely Lieutenant Gaffney. Horan was removed to the county infirmary in Tralee, where a bullet was extracted from his back the following day, and he recovered from his injury. During the ruckus, Mrs. Kate O'Connor and her daughter Alice tried to protect the men who were being attacked and assaulted by Gaffney and his soldiers. At one point, a soldier rested the barrel of his gun on Mrs. O'Connor's shoulder as he took pot shots at the men. She was told to say an act of contrition and was told that she would be shot. Crucially, Mrs. O'Connor later identified Gaffney as one of those involved in the raid that morning. She was able to do so as he had been to the house before in search of members of the family and men on the run. In a statement, her daughter Alice O'Connor described some of what she and her mother endured during the raid, and I quote, I was standing near Conhorn Horden and I heard him scream and he turned around. Two raiders came in and one went as far as the porch and the other fellow went searching the house. I cracked several matches and he used to slap them out of my hand and then he slapped me across the face and loosened a couple of my teeth. Alice and her mother were repeatedly struck with the butts of the soldiers' rifles, and after a short while, Gaffney, who was described as smelling strongly of whiskey, returned with his men to their post in Castle Island. He later visited the Garda station in Scarta Glen, telling Garda Patrick Spillane that he had, quote, creased a couple of fellas at Drumulton. So what prompted the attack on the O'Connor homestead just hours after the killing of Sergeant Woods. There is no evidence to link David O'Connor or anyone in the family to the murder. But throughout Gaffney's career, acting on evidence was never one of his strong points or a prerequisite for action. 
Army headquarters in Tralee had sanctioned a sweep of the area by local soldiers to try secure evidence about the death of Sergeant Woods, but Gaffney took this instruction as a carte blanche to indulge in what he enjoyed best, terrorising Republicans and the population generally. Gaffney essentially used the death of Sergeant Woods to target known Republicans who had been active during the Civil War in ambush, ambushing and sniping at him and his colleagues, even if they had no links to the events at Scarta Glen Garda Station. A report for the Garda Commissioner claimed that the raid on Mrs O'Connor's house and the shooting of Horn was in the nature of a reprisal against the O'Connor family on account of their republicanism. Gaffney, as I said, it would appear, used the killing of Sergeant Woods the previous night to throw his weight around, to target the homes of local Republicans and to terrify many in the locality as a result. The almost fatal wounding of Conhoran has been largely forgotten in the accounts of this period and he might well have become another unfortunate victim of the Free State Army, but he survived. The shooting provoked further shock and fear in the community and according to the Cork Examiner, the wounding of Conhoran terrified many in the area, prompting some residents to, quote, flee their homes in fear. A Garda superintendent observed that there was, quote, a decided reluctance of talking to the Gardaí after what had occurred. Gaffney and his fellow officers had not completed their reprisals in Scarta Glen, however. Three days after Woods died, Gaffney and his men went drinking in Scarta Glen a phenomenon which was not uncommon where Gaffney was concerned. Before dawn, at about 5.30 in the morning, a group of soldiers under Gaffney and wearing civilian clothes went to the village. They gained access to local public houses. They remained drinking for most of the day. Again, in this instance, the intoxication of soldiers on duty and the normality of this heavy drinking is a feature of the case. At about six o'clock that evening, the 6th of December, this is three days after the death of Sergeant Woods, an army lorry arrived in Scarta Glen and collected Gaffney and the other soldiers who had been drinking all day. These soldiers, including Daniel Brosnan, Sergeant Michael Shea, Private Michael Shea, James McCusker, Dennis Lean and Robert McNeil, drove as far as the Chapel Cross near the village where they stopped the vehicle on Gaffney's instruction. Significantly, all of them were wearing civilian clothing rather than their army uniforms. They were carrying four rifles and two revolvers between them. Gaffney handed his Peter the Painter gun to Dennis Lean, instructing him and two others to walk back into the village and to bring out a young man called Thomas Brosnan. Gaffney muttered that he wanted young Brosnan brought out, quote, so that we can crease him. Three of Gaffney's men walked the short distance to the home and public house of Cornelius Con Broston, pictured here on the right. Con Broston was a local blacksmith who also ran a bar in the village and who was known to be a quiet and popular man with his neighbours. He and his wife had just one son, 19-year-old Thomas Broston. At about 6.30pm on the 6th of December, the three soldiers, including Dennis Lean, Michael O'Shea and Daniel Broston, entered Con Broston's bar. Lean, who was armed with the Peter the Painter gun, inquired as to the whereabouts of young Thomas, saying he wanted a word with him. Con Broston told the soldiers that Thomas was at his grandmother's house a short distance away. So he took the men to his mother's house and they returned to Broston's bar with Thomas. Lean and his accomplices asked for whiskey. Shortly afterwards, they left, taking Thomas Broston with them. The soldiers told Con that his son would be back shortly. Thomas Brosnan was walked a few hundred yards in the direction of Castle Island by the three soldiers until they met Gaffney on the road. On Gaffney's instruction, and without explanation, Lean shot Thomas Brosnan several times in the back. Brosnan was still alive, and according to evidence given later, Gaffney, quote, finished him off. As the soldiers drove back to Castle Island, Lieutenant Gaffney warned his men, Never let on, boys, that we are after creasing that fellow. He also warned his men not to tell anyone in the army that they were in Scarta Glen that day or that they would be shot. 
Meanwhile, Con Brosnan became concerned for his son and he went to his neighbours' houses looking for him before going to the Garda station. With Garda Boylan, one of those who had been out on patrol the night Sergeant Woods was killed, Con went in search of his young son. They began to walk towards Castle Island looking for Thomas. Garda Boylan spotted a body lying on the side of the road and a short distance from Scarta Glen. Immediately, Con Broston recognised his son, who was lying face down on the road. He had been shot several times through the back and was dead. Con Broston and Garda Boylan brought the body of Thomas back to the Broston home a few hundred yards away. Dr William Prendeville of Castle Island was called and identified several gunshot wounds in Thomas's remains. The uh, stills on the screen, by the way, are from a Midas Productions docudrama on the killing of Thomas Broston, uh, which was broadcast by uh, T.G. Cahern in 2014, um, and I appreciate their sharing the, uh, the programme with me. The jury at the inquest into the death of Thomas Broston returned a verdict, quote, that deceased died from shock and hemorrhage resulting from bullet wounds inflicted by members of the National Army. Garda Commissioner Owen O'Duffy, who was still in Kerry following the death of Sergeant Woods, visited the Broston family home to express his condolences. And according to the Cork Examiner, O'Duffy was visibly emotional as he expressed to the sobbing father and invalid mother his deep sympathy in their awful bereavement. There was nothing to link Thomas Broston with the attack on Scarta Glen Garda Station and no evidence to suggest that he knew of the planned robbery. So why was he targeted by Gaffney and killed in cold blood on the roadside a short distance from his home? The murder of Thomas Broston prompted as much confusion as it did revulsion. Reports about his friendship and allegiances varied. Con Broston issued a statement that his son was, quote, always good friends with the military and with the civic guards since they came to the village. It was suggested by Kerry Gardy that Broston was certainly friendly with the civic guards, but was also, quote, playing a double game and was in league with the irregular element. Another account referred to Broston as a mild supporter of the free state. But in reality, and in fact, Broston was described in the military archives files on the case as a dispatch carrier and intelligence officer with the local IRA. But being involved in the local anti-treaty IRA did not imply that Broston had anything to do with capital murder and the killing of Sergeant Woods. If Gaffney hadn't intended to kill Thomas Broston, could the sourcing of information from him have been the motivation in attacking him? In one report from uh, the local superintendent to the Garda Commissioner, it was suggested that the blacksmith's son might have been aware who was involved in the attack. Superintendent Kelly said it was very difficult to assign a motive for the killing, but that Braston was probably taken by the army with the intention of obtaining information and that when he wouldn't give it, he was shot. Ultimately, the authorities were not convinced that Broston had anything to do with the attack on the local Garda station. In a report in the killing, it was stated that the chief superintendent of the Garda Shia Kona in Kerry does not believe that Thomas Broston was a member of the party which raided the Garda station at Scarta Glen, where Sergeant, Sergeant James Woods was murdered. But there was another possible motive for the killing of Thomas Broston one that had nothing to do with politics or the murder of a Garda. Was Gaffney's targeting of Thomas Broston rooted in personal rather than political motives? For some time before the death of Broston, Gaffney had been in a relationship with Ellen Lena Keane, who worked as a nurse in the locality. Ellen Keane was a relative through marriage of the Broston family of Scarta Glen, her husband was John Broston of Carker, Scarta Glen, a first cousin of Con Broston. The marriage did not last long and John Broston left his wife after a few months and went to America. Thereafter, Ellen Keane began a relationship with Jeremiah Gaffney and they lived together for two or three months. According to evidence later given in court, 
Ellen Keane became known locally as Mrs Gaffney and their relationship became something of a scandal. According to records and newspaper reports, Con Brosnan and the wider Brosnan family did not approve of Ellen's relationship with the young Free State officer. As a result, apparently, there was bad blood between Con Brosnan and Ellen Keane. And according to evidence later given in court, Ellen Keane admitted to pouring Jay's fluid into Con Brosnan's well at the back of his house in an apparent case of attempted poisoning, something which she admitted to. Con Brosnan and Ellen Keane it was reported, did not speak for 12 months thereafter. In evidence subsequently given a trial, Gaffney claimed that Ellen Keane had told him that Thomas Broston was involved in the killing of Sergeant James Woods. It also emerged that after he murdered Broston that night, and when the soldiers were on their way back to Castle Island, Gaffney told his men that he had received information from Ellen Keane that led him to kill Thomas Broston. If this is the case, the tragic death of Brosnan on the 6th of December 1923 was born out of resentments within the wider Brosnan family. The evidence in reports from the time and testimony given sub subsequently in court suggests that Gaffney used an allegation made by his lover to brutally attack the young blacksmith's son with the objective of intimidating those who disapproved of his romantic connections with Ellen Keane. It is also reasonable to conclude that he used the cover of the killing of Sergeant James Woods to enact this very deadly revenge in the hope or understanding that the killing of Broston was not, would not be fully investigated or that it would somehow be accepted by the authorities as a reprisal killing following the death of Sergeant Woods. Garda and military authorities were under very significant pressure to act following the murder of Thomas Broston. It quickly became known that Jeremiah Gaffney and his henchmen in the Free State Army in East Kerry were the culprits. Lieutenant Gaffney and five other soldiers were arrested a few days after the death of Thomas Broston. And apart from Gaffney, those arrested were Michael O'Shea, Michael or Mickey Shea, James McCusker, Robert McNeil and Daniel Broston. Each of them would face different charges. McNeil, for example, was immediately dismissed from the force after being quizzed about the murder, having objected or claimed to having uh, be, being an objector to Gaffney's killing of Broston on the night. Gaffney was brought before District Justice Johnson in court in Tralee and charged with the murder of Thomas Broston on the 6th of December. The case opened before Judge Richard Johnson at Tralee Courthouse and before a gallery packed with spectators. After hearing preliminary evidence, Justice Johnson accepted that the case was eligible for a full trial and he remanded Gaffney in custody to Cork Jail. Before the hearing concluded, the judge asked Gaffney if he had anything to say. No, I don't wish to make any statement, was his reply. In a further dramatic twist to this story, Lieutenant Gaffney escaped from custody while being detained in Tralee. This was an absolutely sensational development. A senior figure in the Kerry command of the Free State Army, charged with the murder of a 19-year-old civilian, escaping from custody and now on the run. It was suggested that he was facilitated in escaping from Tralee Garda Station by members of the Garda themselves, including an Inspector McCabe. Incredibly, and in further evidence that Gaffney was a fearless law unto himself, after he escaped from the Garda station in Tralee, he went for a few drinks in a bar in the town and got a cap and overcoat to create a disguise. From there, he brazenly returned to army headquarters at the Brian Houlihan barracks in Tralee and went to his room, leaving his tunic and Sam Brown belt on the bed before changing into civilian clothes and fleeing the town. Needless to say, Commissioner Owen O'Duffy was furious about the reputational damage of Gaffney's escape from custody, telling one official in the Department of Home Affairs that the escape of Lieutenant Gaffney has created a most unfavourable impression on the public mind, both concerning the Garda and even the executive, and that one of the public servants of the state should so far forget his oath and his obligations to the public as to allow even through negligence the escape of a prisoner detained for the most serious crime known to the law, 
is almost unbelievable. Gaffney managed to get back to his native Dublin and in a further extraordinary development, which attracted dramatic headlines across the country, a nationwide manhunt was launched in an effort to find him. There were reports of alleged sightings of Gaffney in different parts of the country, including, for example, in Dingle. It must be remembered that political pressure on the army and Guardi at this time was intense, that a lieutenant in the Free State Army was not only being accused of murder, but that he was also now on the run, placed great pressure on the government and the authorities to bring Gaffney to justice. On the 9th of January 1924, Gaffney was arrested following the search for property at North Richmond Cottages in Dublin, not far from where he had been born. Involved in the search party was none other than Major General Paddy O'Daly, formerly head of the Kerry Command of the Army in Kerry, pictured here, and who was of course synonymous with Free State Army brutality in Kerry during the Civil War. At gunpoint, Gaffney surrendered and handed over his revolver and ammunition to O'Daly before being taken into custody by detectives. He was again formally charged with the murder of Thomas Braston. What a remarkable irony it was that Jeremiah Gaffney was being arrested on the charge of murder by Paddy O'Daly, a man who oversaw countless brutal murders of so many Republicans in Kerry during the Civil War. But what of the soldier who lured Thomas Bruston from his home to his death on the 6th of December? Incredibly, volunteer Dennis Lean, who had called to Bruston's bar on the night and who'd shot Bruston before he finally died, absconded to Liverpool with the intention of travelling to Canada to evade justice. A guard the sergeant in Tralee was dispatched to Liverpool with an arrest warrant and Lean was apprehended before being charged with murder at the Central Police Station in Liverpool. He was subsequently brought before the Irish courts and charged with murder. The government considered the Gaffney case on the 10th of March 1924. The Minister for Home Affairs, Kevin O'Higgins, here on the right, was petitioned by some of Gaffney's comrades who suggested his actions in Kerry were, quote, foreign to his natural tendencies. It must be remembered, however, that O'Higgins, in particular, had been very disturbed about the behaviour of the army in Kerry during and after the Civil War. After the infamous Kinmare case of June 1923, for example, when two young women were brutally assaulted by Paddy O'Daly and others, O'Higgins had, had threatened to resign from government. He was particularly dismayed that his government colleague, Richard Mulcahy, the Minister for Defence, continued to stand by the Kerry command in the face of evidence of illegality and brutality in the ranks in Kerry. Many in government by this time, therefore, will not have been too concerned to see Gaffney brought to trial and made an example of. Gaffney and Lean were finally put on trial at the Dublin City Commission before Mr Justice Jonathan Pym. Each of the accused entered pleas of not guilty. Separately, two other soldiers, McCusker and McNeil, were charged with aiding and abetting. I do not propose to give a detailed account of the trial here. Uh, much of the evidence is, uh, has been referenced earlier. But in summarising the case, William Carrigan, SC, for the prosecution, did not mince his words. He declared, The murdered man, Thomas Bruston, was 19, the only child of his parents, under circumstances of the most deliberate, cold-blooded villainy. And in the instance of Gaffney, that youth was foully butchered in a manner so treacherous, so revolting, that it would be a disgrace and terror to a tribe of savages. John Brosnan, Thomas's father, pictured here, gave evidence about what had occurred on the evening of the 6th of December, and he was accompanied in Dublin by a large number of relatives and friends from Scarta Glen. In another bizarre twist, Gaffney's defence counsel attempted to use an injury he'd sustained as a teenager to explain his violent temper. When he was just 14 years old, Gaffney had fractured his skull and underwent surgery, and part of his skull was removed. The surgeon in that instance told the court that the effect of the surgery meant that if, he'd, if he had any excitement, he would become mentally incapable of dealing with any problems that came up before him. 
It was also suggested that the effect of the injury to Broston's skull, when, or to Gaffney's skull, excuse me, when coupled with the consumption of a large quantity of alcohol, had a serious effect on Gaffney's behaviour. A large quantity of drink had been consumed the day Thomas Broston was shot, so did this explain what had occurred? The evidence impressed neither judge nor jury. The jury deliberated for four hours and at 11pm they returned their verdict. Jeremiah Gaffney was found guilty of the murder of Thomas Broston and was sentenced to death by hanging. In a short statement to the court, Gaffney thanked the jury and his counsel, but he insisted that he hadn't received a fair trial. But what of his co-accused, Dennis Lean? Gaffney was about to make one last dramatic move. Two days before his execution, he wrote a note in which he took full responsibility for the murder of Thomas Broston, absolving his co-accused, Private Lean, of any such responsibility. He admitted to ordering Lean to shoot Thomas Broston and to finishing the job himself. Private Dennis Lean was also found guilty of the charge of murder and sentenced to death. But following Gaffney's intervention, his sentence was commuted to penal servitude for life. At 8 a.m. on the 13th of March, 1924, Jeremiah Gaffney was hanged at Mountjoy Jail. His execution was carried out by the infamous British hangman, Albert Pierpoint, who was the principal hangman in Ireland, as well as Britain at the time. A small crowd had assembled outside the prison walls and it was noted that none of Gaffney's relatives or friends were present. The execution of Jeremiah Gaffney dominated the newspaper headlines. Days later, a further twist occurred when a letter from the aforementioned nurse Ellen Keane was published in the Irish Independent. She denied any involvement in the murder of Thomas Broston. She admitted a falling out with Con Broston over the well at the back of his house, but insisted that over the previous year and a half, she had been on the best of terms with Con Broston and his son Thomas. She wrote in her letter to the Irish Independent, There was scarcely a night passed within three months previous to the murder, but they visited my father's house, and even the night of the murder, he, Con Broston, was in the house. All members of my family helped him in every way they could during his trouble attended to the people that came to his son's wake, etc. I am prepared to swear in any court that I knew nothing about this terrible murder. It was a letter which was insufficient to spare Jeremiah Gaffney his fate. I have moved significantly away from where this story began, the murder of Sergeant James Woods in December 1923. What of the investigation into his death? It was an investigation which went on for almost two years. Part of the problem in catching his killers and those who stole items from the Garda station in Scarter Glen was that very few people were willing to cooperate with the authorities. Garda encountered a civilian population which was reluctant to assist with their inquiries. Writing to the Commissioner in April 1925, one superintendent noted, This place is very remote and the inhabitants are hostile. However, between February and July 1924, several local men were arrested in connection with the murder of Sergeant Woods, including Daniel Casey, Paddy O'Glynes, John Jack Kelly, Tim Reardon, Dennis Nolan and Cornelius Cronin. Insofar as records can provide information on the involvement of those arrested, there are references in various archives to some if not all of the men being involved or connected with Republican activity locally or that they had been active in the IRA during the Civil War. For example, John Kelly, one of those arrested, is described as, quote, an irregular in various accounts. Gordy concluded that the plot was hatched to burgle the Garda station at the home of Paddy O'Glynes, who lived at Knockriac, Scarta Glen. Lyons was described as an advisor to the group. Another suspect, Edward Marshall, was a nephew of Paddy O'Glynes. Each of those arrested was charged in connection with the robbery of items at the Garda station and the death of Sergeant Woods, and they were taken into custody under the Public Safety Act of 1924. Local Garda also suspected the involvement of others, including Michael Healy of Glown Lee, 
Tim Andy Healy of Nakaharan, Dennis Sullivan of Nakaharan, and Lawrence Kelly of Tornanuk Kilcommon, all of whom are mentioned in confidential police reports held in the National Archives. Michael Healy was arrested in June 1924 and charged with armed robbery. Healy was a cousin of Con Cronin, the alleged driver on the evening of the road of the raid. There were allegations that the accused prior to their detention had called to people in the locality and warned them not to mention their names in connection with the outrage, or they would meet the same fate as Sergeant Woods. Police, for example, accused the sister of Daniel Casey, one of the accused, of admitting that her brother had been involved in the crime, quoting her as saying that it's nothing to be ashamed of. He is fighting for his country. It's clear, though, that from the outset, the evidence against many of the accused was pretty thin. Of those arrested, Tim Reardon, for example, was released immediately without charge. In many cases, the accused were detained in jail for several months without being formally charged in what was largely an abuse of the public safety legislation. Many of those who were accused and remanded in custody protested their innocence. Daniel Casey of Ballantowrig's Gartic Glen, for example, insisted that he could prove he was elsewhere when the shooting occurred. He petitioned the Minister for Home Affairs in August 1924, saying, I can truthfully say that I never had been a party to any act of violence and bloodshed and can defy anybody to prove otherwise. In June 1924, Father O'Halloran, the parish priest of Killeen Tierna, wrote that all of the people here believe that Dan Casey is innocent of the crime of which he is charged and stated that Casey was of good character. There was a sustained local campaign in support of those jailed, particularly among their families. In the letter here on the right, a sister of Paddy O'Glines, Ellen Nine, implored the Minister for Home Affairs, Kevin O'Higgins, to sanction his release, insisting that her brother was innocent. My brother is not suspected by the civic guards of being concerned in the Scartaglin affair. He has served almost nine months. The staunchest government supporters in East Kerry consider his treatment hard and unjust. Political pressure was also brought to bear as many of the accused continued to remain in jail without being brought to trial. Professor John Marcus O'Sullivan, a common and Isle TD for Kerry, queried whether there was any evidence against Paddy O'Glines and argued that local opinion held that he had no role in the killing of Sergeant Woods. Interventions were also made by the Minister for Fisheries and Kerry TD Fionan Lynch, who was advised in December 1924 that Paddy O'Glines would not be released. I think it's significant that O'Sullivan and Lynch, who were both common and oil TDs, um, believed that those who were in jail were actually innocent of the charges, that two government TDs were making representations on behalf of those in jail suggest that even they were convinced of their innocence. As the pressure mounted on local Gardaí to identify and charge the killer or killers of Sergeant Woods, the Chief Superintendent of the Gardaí in Kerry wrote to Commissioner Owen O'Duffy to reassure him of their case against the prisoners. Writing in July 1924, Superintendent Hannigan said, Since my last report, the irregular terror has completely broken down in this district and the people are talking quite freely. The people of the district have not the slightest doubt as to their guilt, and the parish priest who pleads for their release does not, to put it very mildly, represent the feeling of any small section of the people in the district. These men must not be released in the interests of justice. Hannigan was putting a positive spin on the investigation. In reality, the lack of evidence or eyewitness testimony which definitively identified the killers and the raiders was very much lacking. Lawrence Kelly, one of the accused, was also released from custody. His case was taken up in the Dáil by the Labour Party leader Thomas Jos Johnson, who insisted that Kelly's detention following a raid on his home without a warrant was very irregular. In a letter to the minister, Johnson stated that Lawrence Kelly was widely believed to have been innocent of any involvement in the crime. He also tabled a Dáil question on the matter. The Department of Home Affairs came under significant pressure with regard to the conditions in Cork Jail, where the men were being held, and a peace commissioner who visited the jail took statements from some of the prisoners who claimed, The butter is not good, 
the tea is very bad. We're on plank beds. We consider four hours daily exercise is not enough. The Peace Commissioner appealed to the Minister to have the men released. Eventually, however, the authorities did put someone on trial in relation to the raid at Scarta Glen, which led to the death of Sergeant Woods. In January 1925, Michael Healy of Glownlee, Scarta Glen, a lieutenant in the anti-treaty IRA, went on trial at the Central Criminal Court in relation to the attack on Scarta Glen Garda Station. Garda Patrick Spillane, who was in Scarta Glen Garda Station on the night that Woods was killed, gave evidence against Healy. Spillane recounted how he'd been marched up the stairs, told to strip off and hand over his uniform, and described how the assailants had made off with the money as well as his pocket watch. Spillane identified Healy by his aquiline nose, or its curved shape, which he said was visible through his mask on the night, as well as Healy's broad build. But the charge against Michael Healy was one of armed robbery, which he denied, and not one of murder. Healy, who insisted he was elsewhere on the night, was acquitted. Shortly afterwards, several other prisoners who had been detained at Cork Prison were released. Nobody was ever prosecuted for the murder of Sergeant James Woods. So to conclude, what was the legacy and significance of this dreadfully tragic period and what were the afterlives of some of those affected. The fact that two senior soldiers, Lean and Gaffney, were tried and Gaffney was executed represented a major shift in the approach to army outrages in Kerry and stood in very stark contrast to the cover ups which typified Bahak's, Countess Bridge, Bally Seedy, and elsewhere during the Civil War. The prosecution and execution by the state of Jeremiah Gaffney contrasts sharply with the previous official attitude towards extrajudicial killings carried out by the army in Kerry and indeed elsewhere. If only Paddy O'Daly and others had been put on trial for murder in 1923-1924. Political expediency, of course, dictated otherwise. The political ground had shifted in the period after the Civil War. There was an army mutiny at the beginning of 1923. Political tensions were high and the government was keen to be seen to enforce law and order in the army, as well as in society generally. Jeremiah Gaffney was to be made an example of. In relation to Gaffney and the activities of the Free State Army at this time, the entire episode points to a key legacy of the Civil War in Kerry in terms of elements of the army being completely out of control and acting as a law unto themselves. A critical report on the murder of Thomas Brosnan, which was co-authored by the local district justice, the state solicitor for Kerry and the guard the chief superintendent, wrote in a damning indictment of the army that the conduct and attitude of the officers of the 7th Infantry Battalion has been such that we believe their removal from this area would be in the interests of the peace and good order of this county. Private Dennis Lean the only other man uh, who, along with Gaffney, was found guilty of the murder of Thomas Broston, was released from prison in May 1926, less than three years after the killing. Lean had petitioned the government, pleading to be released, and his petition, which is held in the National Archives, points a very, or sorry, paints a very vivid picture of the instability and volatility in the army at the time, as well as the wider politics at play. And I think it's worth quoting briefly from Lean's petition to the minister, because I think it uh, draws attention to many of those um, aspects of uh, what was taking place at the time. Lean wrote, I would like to draw attention to the fact that similar occurrences to that of the shooting of Thomas Braston took place in Kerry previous to that incident. And when I did not see those responsible being brought to justice, I naturally took it for granted that those things had the sanction of general headquarters. How then was I to be expected to discriminate in such matters? Even if I'd shot the prisoner dead under such circumstances, I'm convinced that I would not be guilty of and should not be charged with murder. It's obvious that I could have no personal motive to shoot a man that I'd never seen or know anything about. 
must I then spend my life in a prison cell because I fought to establish law and order and for the existence of an Irish government, and at a time too when diligent soldiers were scarce. In relation to the family of Jeremiah Gaffney, in later years his mother applied for a military service pension in respect of her son's role with the IRA and his service in the Free State Army. Christine Gaffney was informed, however, that her case, quote, was not one which can be considered under the terms of the Army Pensions Acts. The family of Thomas Brosnan would also be denied compensation for their son's death. The authorities concluded that there was insufficient evidence to prove Thomas Brosnan's active service with the IRA, which was the key eligibility requirement. Despite the intervention of some politicians like Fred Crowley, the Fianna Fáil TD for South Kerry during the 30s and 40s, whose correspondence can be seen here on the right, the department would not budge, and the Brostons were denied any form of compensation for their loss. In relation to the case of Sergeant Woods, where all this story began, his colleague who was with him at Scarta Glen Garda Station on the night of the robbery, Garda Patrick Spillane, sustained a very heavy beating on the night in question. He was later transferred to Skibbereen in his native county Cork, and during the Second World War he was seconded from the Gardaí to become head of the local defence force. In 1972 he was one of the Garda veterans who was presented with a shield to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the founding of the force. He died in December 1981, and his son Patrick was also a member of Angarda Siakana. The first memorial plaque to Sergeant Woods was unveiled at Castle Island Garda Station on the 26th of September 1995 by the then Garda Commissioner Paddy Culligan. When the new station opened in Castle Island in 2015, a new memorial plaque was unveiled by the then Commissioner Noreen O'Sullivan and with the support and input of the Woods family, as well as the former Chief Superintendent of Angarda Siakana in Kerry, Donald O'Sullivan. Ultimately, this is a story of personal tragedies and the needless loss of so many lives at a traumatic and turbulent period in the history of our country. Whatever the politics at play and the personal animosities involved, three young men died in a period when civil war tensions and enmities remained. 100 years on, it's important to remember their stories and what occurred in East Kerry during those tragic days not least so that the memory of what occurred is retained and that we can continue to appreciate and understand what happened at such a critical juncture in our history. I began to research the story of Sergeant Woods and uh, its aftermath when I was um, researching my book on the Civil War in Kerry, uh, No Middle Path, which is available uh, from uh, it's published for Marian Press, and indeed through my own website, uh, and my contact details are there on the screen. Uh, if anyone would like to follow um, further uh, episodes of history of our local history uh, and learn more about the period, could I also briefly mention and invite people to consider joining the Kerry Archaeological and Historical Society, of which I've been a member. Uh, and this talk and presentation arose from uh, an invitation I received from the Society to speak uh, recently in Killarney uh, about the events of this period. Uh, membership of the Society is open at all times and it's just €35 Euro for individual membership, which entitles members to a range of uh, free talks and events during the year, as well as outings, as well as a copy of the annually published Kerry magazine and the uh, Kerry Journal. Uh, you can find out more information at www.kerryhistory.ie. So thank you for listening to my presentation. Uh, I hope you found it informative and uh, I look forward to perhaps sharing other stories from our collective history uh, at a future date. Uh,